This year is an extraordinary year for Sundance. We've never had so many contemporary issues, social justice, human rights, uh, documentaries premiere. And that's where storytelling is at. That's, um, that's where the field is going. We have our, some of our best artists working on these issues. Um, and we know that words matter. They remind us who we are. And these stories want to tell us what we can be. So I'm going to op this, open this panel by saying, you know, the title is Now or Never. And I want each of you, and I'll start with you, Dennis, to address um, what we have to do now in your mind uh, to prevent the never. There, there was this cartoon in Peanuts where Charlie Brown was lying in bed. It was night. And he was moaning about global population. He was moaning about pollution. He was moaning about the nuclear weapons facing off against one another. And he says, I, often I, I lie here just thinking about all of these things and hoping for some sort of guidance that will get me past them. And this voice comes off from a balloon on the side saying, this is going to take more than one night. Uh, it's sort of, I've got three or four minutes to sort of discuss the major threats and opportunities of the world. I'm not going to be able to do that too effectively. So what I will do instead is, uh, following the advice of Sarah Palin, what I will do instead <laughs> is, is list, list, list a number of... to be appointed in the administration, yeah? <laughs> list a number of things that are big problems that I think in a conversation we might be able to talk about some solutions to. And some of them are things we haven't paid much attention to. One is current global population. Um, I, I've, for the last 40 years, talked about this issue using various sorts of metaphors. The one that I'm currently using is weight. If you look at simply the weight of human beings on the Earth, it's now more than eight times the weight of all other land-based vertebrates, other than our own domesticated animals. So we are increasingly shoving out of their little niches in the global ecosystems, the orangutans, the tigers, the polar bears, the grizzlies, the what have you. Um, there are more tigers now in zoos than there are tigers that are outside of zoos. And to the extent that you want a world that has sustainable agricultural systems, sustainable fisheries, sustainable energy systems, sustainable climate, sustainable, at some point this population certainly has to stop and I would say it has to decline. The, the work on what's sustainable at different levels is um, not as extensive as it should be, but a pretty good study at Stanford trying to figure out what you could do with existing and foreseeable technologies with a global population in which everyone would have the ability to live at a standard of living in Sweden, said that the global population care capacity is about uh, two and a half billion people. We are now six and a half billion people, almost certainly going to eight billion people, and there are no very good answers to that that I'm aware of that are not going to run into religious, moral, political, economic, what have you kinds of problems. Second, um, I would talk about the stew of brand new pollutants that we are throwing into the environment, uh, endocrine disruptors being the, the latest fancy one, um, all kinds of antibiotics. I, I, fell down on a, I'm embarrassed to say this here, on a patch of ice. And it didn't hurt my elbow enough that it ripped my jacket or anything, but it did cause a small little puncture wound in my uh, elbow. This is a couple days before Christmas, and in that puncture wound, it shoved some bacteria that happened to be on my skin into my arm. In three days, this was roughly the size of a small child's baseball bat, and I went to my physician to get it taken care of, and he says, uh, that's an antibiotic resistance strain. I'm not sure what we can do. Pretty good chance we're going to have to hook you up to intravenous feeding tonight in the hospital. Send me to a specialist. He put me on the strongest antibiotic that exists out there that you can take in a tablet form. And it's now the swelling's gone down. The discoloration is beginning to fade. But it's, it's a month later, and it's still there. Uh, I was lucky. There are all sorts of people that get infections like this that are much bigger, and they die, or they lose limbs. And it's gotten to be such now that we're throwing into so many of our farm animals and other things, even prophylactically to domestic pets, that it's, it's sterilizing the grounds, uh, killing all of the, the, the creatures. That, If you go up into the places where we grow potatoes in Idaho and eastern Washington, it's dead ground. There are no nutrients in it, except those that we apply as fertilizers. There's no living organisms to add tilth to the soil. All that the soil provides is, is something to retain a little bit of water and provide a structure for the plant to grow out of. And on and on and on. The antibiotics thing is big, but the whole chemical stew and their synergistic interactions are, are 
are frightening, and we don't know what we're doing. Out in my backyard, Puget Sound, we're now finding a pretty decent fraction of all bottom fish are sort of what we would call here transgender. Uh, they're hermaphrodites. They have confused sexuality. And a lot of that seems to be coming from women's birth control pills that simply are used and then go down the toilet after they pass through your body and go flushing out into Puget Sound. Uh, I mean, one of the small jokes, you can actually tell, and this has to do with Starbucks, no doubt, but, but you can actually now tell differences in Puget Sound seasonally by the flavorings that you have in your lattes. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's funny and it's scary. Um, I, I'm an environmentalist. I can spend the rest of the day doing this. I'm going to take just one more and then leave the really big one for Van. Um, the, the one more that I'll take is nuclear proliferation. And we'll narrow it down, not talking about Russian warheads, not talking about the kinds of things that are evident. But that there is once again a huge cry internationally for nuclear power to be part of the energy mix. People say, we're in a really tight bind, mostly over global warming. We have to do everything, and nuclear has to be part of the mix. I would start with the premise that in the United States, we cannot make a major investment in a type of technology that we are not willing to share with other countries in the world. It's a globalized economy. If we're going to do it, it's good enough for us. It's going to be good enough for, and you fill in the blank. One of the blanks that gets filled in now is Iran. Iran wants to have a complete nuclear fuel cycle. That means it has to enrich. That means it has to be able to reprocess fuel at the end to pull the plutonium out of it to feed the next generation of reactors. It means it has to have breeder reactors. And it wants to do that, and it intends to do that. And because we have not honored our obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, it feels it doesn't have to pay any attention to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, there is no way to have nuclear fuel being a huge part of the global energy economy without having losses. Everything in the global economy has losses. It's called a leakage rate. Gold has a leakage rate. Oil has a leakage rate. Those chairs have a leakage rate, and it's predictable. It's part of the cost of doing business. If you know what you're doing, it takes 12 pounds of plutonium to make a Hiroshima-sized bomb. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, you can do it with 20 pounds. We're talking now about tens of thousands of tons of this stuff circulating through the global economy. And I fear that the proliferation will go not just to nations, but will go to terrorist organizations, possibly to criminal gangs. It's, it's really frightening. And people say it's out of the barn. Well, it's not out of the barn yet. But once you start getting another 5, 10, 15 countries with nuclear fuel cycles, then I fear it's going to be out of the barn. There's no country in the world that has as good a safety record as the United States does. We've got really tough controls on all of the radioisotopes that pass through our economy. The amount of what they call MUF, that's material unaccounted for, this is explosive isotopes that you can turn into bombs, is measurable in several tens of tons. It might be by now 40 tons of stuff which we think is clinging to the insides of various pipes and other things, but we don't know where it is. When we hear a threat now that there's an atom bomb in the basement of the Empire State Building, we have to take it seriously. And then the big one, which I am mostly going to hand off, is within this whole energy and environment mix, the one that actually has some pretty good solutions to it is the use of carbon-based fuels and the consequences of that for the global climate. And uh, having merely teed it off, I will let Van, who is spending his life doing just a wonderful job on that, address it more fully. No applause for that uplifting. <laughs> I, know, I know, it's done silence. Well, uh, first, first of all, I just want to uh, thank Dennis Hayes, who's, uh, who has the moral courage to know all of this and more, and to still continue to do the work that he's doing to uh, bring us back to our best selves. I also just want to thank you. This is a, uh, we're still within the first 48 eight hours of having a governing majority uh, for people who think and believe the way that we do. And uh, give yourselves a round of applause. Anyway. <laughs> um, yesterday was my first day at work. Uh, the, the, the new cabinet, they don't have you know, desks and post-its and stuff yet. Some of them are still being <laughs> Yeah, you know, some of them are still being uh, confirmed. So uh, they all had hangovers yesterday and were <laughs> dressed much like this. And um, but uh, we have great responsibilities and also great gifts. And uh, you wouldn't be in this room 
if you weren't aware of both. And it's my view that now is the time uh, for the full beauty of our humanity, of our art, of our prayer, of our stories, to just rush forward uh, into this huge opening. Uh, I am a fervent believer in the miraculous. And you know, uh, as storytellers, uh, sometimes things have to get really, really bad, right? <laughs> before you really appreciate the good. Sometimes you have to have a breakdown before you can have a breakthrough. So we have now gone through this incredible breakdown. The question is, from whence will come the breakthrough? I will say two things. One, uh, I think it's important for those of us who are storytellers to understand what just happened. If we were talking about a country not our own, this is what we would say just happened. There was an authoritarian regime, right? There was, Right. There was an authoritarian regime which came to power through a coup d'etat um, that essentially suspended the Constitution, uh, that launched unjust wars, uh, that tortured people, and a pro-democracy movement rose up in our country. And a pro-democracy movement was able to take back uh, the parliament, uh, break the one-party authoritarian hold, and then swept into power uh, its uh, most shining example of its own values. And that pro-democracy movement now has the opportunity to govern. That's, that's where we are. Okay. Now, that is a miraculous outcome. And it is also the equivalent, that entire story is the equivalent of The Hobbit. Right? All of that was just introducing the characters, uh, setting up the universe, getting all, and now we actually have the true story. And what is the true story? The true story is that it's not just uh, Barack Obama who's on trial, or you know, US standing in the world that's on trial, um, or our ability to deal with some of the uh, issues just described as on trial. Western civilization is on trial. Western civilization is on trial. Uh, was Western civilization a huge mistake? Uh, were the indigenous people right? Uh, are we locusts? Or are we honeybees? Our species is on trial. See. And we have a very limited time in which to answer the question, which is great, right? That makes a great movie, right? Yeah. That makes a great story. I mean, it's like this, this is, we get, you know, four to 15 years. And thank goodness that you're here. Because many of you have spent much of your life perfecting your craft, uh, learning uh, how to tell stories, how to move people, how to tell the truth, how to know the truth. And that's where we are now. So uh, the truth that I want to say something about is the need for a clean energy revolution in this country. Um, as the first step toward restoring our species to some sane relationship with our mother, the Earth. Um, now, if all we do is a clean energy revolution, let me be clear, I want to make two distinctions. I'm going to abuse my privilege here. I said a clean energy revolution. I said nothing about energy independence. Yeah. Note, I didn't say energy independence. You know why? Because we're in America. And if you say things like energy independence, do you know what people say? They say, I'm for it, right? Except they say it like, like I'm from the South, they say, I'm for it, right? And then they say, drill, baby, drill, right? And then they come up with all kinds of bizarre scenarios. They say mean things about the Arabs, right? Uh, that's right up in there. And then the other thing that they do is they come up with all kinds of stuff that they want to do here. They go, good, we'll be independent. We'll, we'll have liquefied coal, you know, and, and we'll have, we'll use tar sands and oil shale and, 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 and we'll burn kittens, you know, any, any carbon-based thing, however immoral, as long as they're American kittens, damn it, we'll burn, it, it's like, okay, so don't have, we can't, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about actual clean and renewable energy, home growing our energy, um, that revolution. Uh, as they step toward dealing with the, with the, carbon, uh, with the climate catastrophe. Uh, we have that opportunity. Uh, we have a Saudi Arabia of clean energy 
in our country. We have a Saudi Arabia of solar energy in our Sun Belt and on rooftops across the country. We have a Saudi Arabia of wind energy in our plain states. What we haven't done is to connect our clean energy power centers with our population centers. And that can be done. Uh, it requires some advances in energy transmission and energy storage, but it can be done. And we can also retrofit and weatherize millions and millions of buildings so they leak less energy. Uh, and we can also move a mass transit agenda. So we can do something radical like use as much mass transit as the Europeans, right? If we did that, we would already have met our Kyoto Protocol uh, obligations. So there are things that we can do. There's low-hanging fruit, and we can talk about it later. But this becomes an opportunity to fix two problems at once, right? Because everything that's good in the fight against global warming is a job. Everything that's good in the fight to save the environment is a job. Solar panels don't put themselves up. Uh, wind turbines don't manufacture themselves. Uh, buildings don't retrofit themselves. Trees don't even plant themselves anymore. Uh, even planting trees is a job. And so we can actually power our way through the recession by repowering the country with clean energy, fight pollution and poverty at the same time, and, and become one country in that process. If we do that, then we get to go from being the world leader in pollution to being the world leader in solutions. And that is a very important uh, challenge for us to meet. In closing, what I want to say about that is the reason it's exciting to me, besides the fact that we have a lot of people who don't have jobs. Uh, you know, I was just in Detroit. And uh, anybody, anybody been to New Orleans since? Go to Detroit now. Go to Detroit now. It looks exactly the same. Empty street after empty street, boarded up home. People are drowning on dry land because of the economic distress. And to be able to say to people in that city, we want to put Detroit back to work, not making SUVs to destroy the world, but making wind turbines and smart batteries and solar panels to help save the world. That we, we, we want to use our industrial base, but General Motors isn't called General Cars, right? It's not General SUVs, General Trucks, it's General Motors, and the motors that we need are for the wind turbines, right? 8,000 finely machined parts in each wind turbine. That's a car. Yeah. Each wind tower, 20 tons of steel. You can put your steel workers back to work. You can put your uh, uh, auto workers back to work. See, That's the opportunity that we have. Now, what I will say in closing is that if we do that, we've actually turned our pro-democracy movement into something even more profound, uh, green, restorative hope for humanity movement. That's our next challenge. Now, Barack Obama has done something extraordinary. Because of him, America is back for the very first time. Right? America is back for the very first time. That's his magic. That's his genius. You see, he gave us a country we were promised in kindergarten that we never had before. That's what he's done. If we do what I'm describing and more, uh, we will do more than take America back for the first time in at least 40 years, we will finally take America forward. Thank you very much. It's very hard to sit next to somebody with whom you agree so fervently that you're <laughs> nodding your head in passionate agreement. Um, I want to thank... Um, and probably somewhat unusual. <laughs> I want to thank Kara and the Sundance uh, Documentary Fund for inviting me and uh, to all of you here for joining us and my fellow panelists. It's um, a truly an honor to be here. And I'm actually um, in many ways struck by the fact that what I'm about to say comes very appropriately after two people who've given much of their lives to focusing um, both on the environment and in Van's case also around questions of economic justice. Because, you know, if you were somebody who was concerned about natural resources, what would you think if I told you that we've been living in a world for some 6,000 years, since human beings first started showing up, in which we've systematically failed to use more than 50% of the significant natural resources that are out there on our planet? 
And if we're in a moment of crisis, and when we're looking at either the proliferation of militarism as an ideology, as the, as the dominant ideology of world politics, because all those other companies, they're not just manufacturing, there's a whole set of other companies Van is talking about that aren't manufacturing cars, that could also be put to work manufacturing turbines and other things. And they're called the war industry. It's called the military industrial complex. And I have news for you folks, it exists and it's doing a fine job. There, what is this natural resource that I'm talking about that we've not tapped into? It's 50% of the world's population. It's women. It's the 50% of the world's population that in most of the world today, including, I would venture, in this one, where if you simply changed something that this country has not brought itself to be able to sign, which is the Equal Pay for Equal Rights, Equal Pay for Equal Work Amendment, 1973, the ERA, the reason why the United States has not signed the Convention for Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, you could half the poverty rate in this country, which currently hovers around 14.5%, without spending one single dime in new programs or initiatives, because women and children make up more than three quarters of who's poor in this country and in the rest of the world. They also make up the over 500,000 people, which in any other instance, if they were in Darfur, for example, or belonged to a particular population group or an indigenous tribe, would be called a genocide. That's 500,000 lives every year that are lost because women don't have access to maternal health care and safe and legal abortions and contraception. That kind of consistent and irresponsible failure to engage with what is an extraordinary asset and what is actually rebuilding in many of the places where war and nuclear proliferation and climate control and all these other terrible, big, scary things are destroying societies, it's those unseen, unheard, unspoken voices that are actually rebuilding those societies, rebuilding them in the aftermath of war, putting an end to war, um, challenging their governments to hold their governments accountable for how much money they're spending on nuclear weapons and how little money they're spending on health or education or any of the other things that I would wager is, has to be a part of this now or never. And if we've gone this far, failing to invest in that more than 50% of our natural resources, we cannot possibly hope to have either the creativity, the imagination, the alternative vision, the possibility that actually fighting wars might not actually be the best way in which to resolve conflicts or disagreements, the sense that actually there is extraordinary interdependence amongst all of us. And so, although I, as somebody who was not born in this country and only recently became a citizen, am celebrating with so many others in this country and around the world, what just happened a few days ago, I think it's extraordinarily important to understand that one of the now or never challenges that we have before us is addressing the profound and persistent inequality that exists across the world between men and women, between rich and poor, both inside our countries and outside our countries. We were just listening to Howard Zinn talking about the fact that wars are actually only um, initiated and called into being by the ruling class, and that the people very rarely are given, or never actually are given the chance to declare war. When in your recent memory have the people stood up and as in a democratic revolution said, we want to go to war with Vietnam, with Iraq. My recollection is that when the people have spoken, it has almost always been that we do not want to go to war. In 2003, the Global Fund for Women, the organization I work with that funds women's rights organizations in 167 countries, started something called the Now or Never Fund. And the Now or Never Fund was started on the eve of the invasion of Iraq. And it was started because we understood that key threats were underway 
that key institutions, the struggle for women to actually have voice as a part of this collective society that we live in, were actually so challenged that this so-called war on terror was actually masking a war on women and was masking a war on women's rights. What do I mean by that? I mean that war in general has a disproportionately terrifying and devastating effect on women and children. Gaza is just the, just the skimming of that. What just happened in these three weeks in Gaza was just the very surface of that. Look at what has happened in Iraq. Women in Iraq had the highest literacy rates. You want to de deal with population? You educate women. You make sure women have choices. You make sure women are decision makers in their families. You make sure women can send their daughters and their sons to school. Iraq went from a country which had a literacy rate of over 80% literacy for women to a country which now has less than 35% literacy rates for women. It went to a country where women and a women's movement had forced Saddam Hussein to change the family code to allow equal inheritance, equal property rights, equal custody after divorce, equal right to divorce, to a country where now women are increasingly covered, silent, and su subject to the kinds of things you're going to see on a film in a few minutes in terms of the resurgence in honor killings. So I simply submit to you that we have in our hands not only the opportunity to change what might be an incredible American revolution, but also to begin to think about this as a global revolution. Because women in the rest of the world are not seeing this as an us against them struggle. This is a struggle that women are standing side by side with men, shoulder to shoulder with men, to say, it's not an opportunity for us to say, let us onto your playing fields, let us into your offices, let us into your law, law firms, let us become doctors and aeronautical engineers. We're asking ourselves, equal to what? Equal to what do we want to be? Equal to kill and maim? Equal to be part of this military complex? Or equal to something greater? equal to a new game that we define together, men and women collectively, a game in which th two thirds of the world's population doesn't continue to live on less than $2 a day. Thank you. I'm gonna find it rather hard to follow that. Um, the only way to do that is, is, to, is to focus on uh, where I come at this from. I'm an English conservative whose um, mother was an organic farmer and she flew Spitfires. So I have some considerable, um, considerable uh, sympathy for everything that's been said on this panel. Uh, and I will come back to, to, to Dennis because I think he said the, 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 the bit that I come in on, which is that if we're talking about now or never, what we have to do first is check, check the narrative. That's the first thing we have to do. Check the narrative as we go into a century, because this century is not going to be the same as the last century. As, as Dennis said, the population is going to go to maybe from 6 billion to maybe 9 billion. And actually, I'm not sure that it isn't going to go to 12 billion by the end of it. And that's going to be very scary indeed. Obviously, that's not going to affect us. It's going to affect our children and our grandchildren. But it's in, in the particular area in which we have brought a film to Sundance, that is affecting us now. Uh, it's affecting uh, us in the the area of food security, uh, not only on land, but in the Cinderella subject, the oceans. Um, and I would just like to, to say that we, we need to check the narratives as we go on. And are we actually going to continue thinking that either the, the, the one big problem is what is facing us, or is it several big problems that are a cluster of problems that are linked? And actually, I think what everyone has been saying fits into these cluster problems. We have, we have population. We have climate change, we have uh, food security, uh, and we have a number of other social problems which, which, which uh, are caused by those things. Uh, we have looked at the, uh, the Cinderella subject, the 70% of the planet that we don't actively live on, that we travel across, uh, or fish in, or do things to. Um, I remember I was, I was at a talk once uh, about food, um, and uh, I, was, I was due to speak and they, they left it until uh, five to one uh, to talk about the 70% of the, 
the planet that, uh, uh, that, 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 that we don't live on. And um, lunch was at one o'clock. So I thought that um, that indicated how we think about the oceans. And yet we're discovering things about the oceans now that are really quite scary, even to conservatives like me, uh, who don't like getting too worked up about things. And um, I'm getting very worked up about the oceans because we are running out of fish. We're running out of fish because we're, well, there are a lot of people, a lot of technology, and we, are, uh, the, the, we only knew that this was a major environmental problem in 2002 when we discovered that the curves had, had tipped down, but they tipped down starting in 1989. The world's wild fish catches started to decline in 1989, but we didn't know that to a paper in 2002. So we have a, a, a conception that we have food security problems on land with, last year we had this big wobble on the world's grain supplies, but we've already got a serious food security problem in the sea. And if you think fish farming is going to solve that, then it won't in the West because 90% of the, the, the food w w that we farm in the sea is carnivorous fish. What do we feed them on? Little fish. Well, we're killing those off too. So number one, we have a food security issue parallels the one on land in the sea. Number two, we have a biodiversity issue. We have a major biodiversity issue on land because with this kind of population, this continued development, this kind of rapine in the rainforests, um, we have a problem. We are losing species. But this particular problem is even worse in the sea because we haven't thought of it that way. We haven't thought of the bluefin tuna in the same bracket as the, uh, the panda or the black rhino. Um, and in fact, they're serving them um, over in Nobu's restaurants. Um, you, you know, we check the narrative. Are we actually doing the right things? Are we actually looking at the century we're going into or back at the one we came from? Third point, global warming. Everybody, the, the Europeans like to think that's the most important thing there is. Um, of the Obama administration quite rightly has said, well, we've got to do something about green energy. This, this, we're going to take on this dreadful eight years of failure under Bush, this dreadful reneging on the Kyoto Treaty. And, and what, when we look at the sea, um, Thanks to, uh, thanks to what happened in a, in, a, in a fascinating scientific study that happened actually as we arrived, published as we arrived in Sundance, we are beginning to realize that there is a great interconnectedness to some of these issues. I mean, this, uh, to, 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 to summarize it as simply as possible, we've discovered that fish poo actually has a huge role in keeping the oceans alkaline, and therefore taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So what do we not have in the oceans that we used to have in profusion 100 years ago, 150 years ago? Well, fish. We have driven down the populations of the northern cod, of the North Sea cod, of the cod of uh, uh, Cape cod, uh, by 95, 96, 97 percent, somewhere around there. The, the, the actual mass, biomass of creatures that aren't there anymore on the northern cod alone, the Grand Banks, was estimated by uh, a friendly professor who was here this week um, as, as the equivalent of 28 million people. Now, if into that discussion we now understand this interconnectedness of things, that bony fish accumulate calcium, calcium that they can't turn into their bone structure because they're constantly drinking calcium in the sea and they, they have to excrete this and thereby uh, creating uh, calcium that's released into the sea very easily. We used to think that it was algae that did this, it was plankton that did this, but it isn't, it's fish doing it. So instead of allowing this little industry that in Britain is no larger than the lawnmower industry to go on running, our, uh, running what happens in the sea um, and, and exploiting 99.6% of it. You can fish in 96% of the sea at the moment. There are, that's how few marine reserves there are. We are going to have to think about that very carefully and we are going to have to bolt overfishing into our co con concept of what uh, uh, global warming is doing to the planet, and we're going to have to bolt it into our resource strategies for dealing with it. We're going to have to create carbon funds to create marine reserves. So the, check the narrative 
is my feeling. If we don't check the narrative, then we're going to make some very bad mistakes in this, in, in this century by thinking that this one is the same as the last one. Great.